This episode of the Lunch with Chris show is brought to you by my upcoming book, 30 Days to Limitless. You can find out more about it at Limitless30.com. This podcast is certified fresh. FreshMediaWorks.com Welcome to the Lunch with Chris show, where your host, Chris Daly, talks with movers and shakers from all walks of life to get their opinions on important questions. Each season, there is a new question and new guests. This short, impactful show skips all the fluff and just brings you insightful answers from great guests. And now, doing his part to change the world in a positive way, your host, Chris Daly. Hey everybody, welcome out to another Lunch with Chris show. I'm your host, Chris Daly. And as you know, this season, I am focusing on what I call everyday heroes. That's right, people who seem like normal folks, living their lives, doing what we all do, but they go above and beyond and do something extra. The true superheroes of our society. My guest today is Ernest Stevens. I discovered him from the show Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops. You're going to love this one. All right, everybody join me in welcoming Ernie Stevens. Uh, Ernie, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Oh, you bet. You bet. I tell you, um, I get the weirdest ideas of who to interview. And I was watching the documentary uh, Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops, and and I have to admit, when I first saw the little image for it, I thought, oh, this is some sci-fi cop show, and then and clicked on it and <laughs> discovered it's a documentary, which I love. Uh, so very cool, very cool. Uh, tell me about the show. Yeah, uh, Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops is a documentary about uh, the San Antonio Police Department's mental health unit. And it features myself and my partner, Joe Smarrow, who were assigned to the mental health unit. Again, we were just two of, at the time, 10 officers, Mm -hmm. uh, but we were asked to participate in this documentary, which when we first heard about the idea, I'm going to be honest with you, I thought there's nothing sexy about a documentary (laughs) of two (laughs) cops in Texas handling handling mental health calls. Um, But if somebody wants to film this, go ahead. Um, Yeah. But prior to the documentary, we did have some success in in some media exposure. Uh, ABC Nightline with Byron Pitts came out and did a story on us. And it was during the time, Chris, when there was a lot of um, uses of force against people in a mental health crisis. Right, right. And the outcomes were were usually negative, uh, which is understandable, not acceptable, but understandable when you're asking police to handle calls that they're really not trained Uh, how to handle specifically when it comes to a mental health crisis. So uh, in San Antonio, we had been training since about 2003 and doing a pretty good job at it. So we had some we had some national exposure. Uh, They ran that story three times uh, Mm -hmm. in 2016, which was the most they ever ran a story. But it was based because of all the uses of force against people uh, that had a mental health crisis. So uh, that led to a, a story in the Atlantic, which got back to the filmmaker of Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops, the brilliant Jen McShane, uh, who came down and contacted us. And funny story, I'll never forget the phone call I got from her. She said, hey, I'm a filmmaker from New York. I want to come down and do a, a ride along with you and your partner and uh, maybe see if there's a chance for a documentary. And I'm like, all right, sure, come on. <laughs> I'm waiting for to bring this film crew and sound crew, kind of like what we're used to. (laughs) Right. She shows up with an iPhone and I'm like, what is going like, what kind of film is this going to (laughs) be? And I'll never forget, you know, she followed us around with a cell phone videotaping because one, she didn't want to be intrusive. Sure. And, and two, she didn't want us to really like play for the camera. Like a lot of people would do. Right. And what she realized very quickly was, that there was a story here because mm-hmm. the first call we went on was an individual that was in a mental health crisis staying at a group home and he was having homicidal ideations to stab and kill mm-hmm. uh, like the group home supervisor. And once we talked to him and de-escalated him, he agreed to go with us voluntarily to go get some help at a treatment center. 
And on the way to the car, he looked at us and said, well, I'm not going to ride in the back of a police car. Now, granted, our cars are unmarked. However, uh, they're Ford Explorers, just black right. with a spotlight. So it's not kind of <laughs> it's not a big surprise. So uh, I told him, well, I'll tell you what, would you feel more comfortable just riding up front and I'll ride in the back? He's like, sure, that's that would be great. So I searched him real quick, make sure he didn't have any weapons. And as we're getting ready to roll, the filmmaker, Jen, pulls me back and goes, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm taking this guy to go get some help. She goes, but you're going to sit in the back behind the cage and put him up front with Joe? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, and what if he attacks Joe? And I'm like, well, that's Joe's problem, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> so she uh, was like, that would have never happened in like New York. They would never treated yeah. somebody with empathy, you know, which I, I agree now. I do think New York sure. police officers have empathy, of course. But I think the the national trend would have been he would have been in handcuffs in the back seat and taken into a hospital. Yeah, definitely. I have to tell you, you mentioned shooting with an iPhone. Uh, I do a lot of stuff with Texas high school football and and used to do it with the big cameras and discovered the iPhone is just as powerful, a heck of a lot cheaper. Oh, I love my iPhone. Yeah, some of the best pictures <laughs> I've ever taken. <laughs> exactly. But uh, talk about that, that approach, because that really struck me early on that you – and then you explained it later. You went up to talk to the gentleman and you got down on his level and you got down and talked with him. You know, how? tell me about the impact that has. So for, for your your listeners who have not seen the film yet, um, it is still streaming on HBO. Mm-hmm. And I encourage you to watch it. If you don't have HBO, just do the free seven day trial, watch it, and then you'll understand a little bit about uh, this conversation. But um, so our approach is we are in plain clothes, right? right? We don't wear a uniform. Uh, our guns are hidden behind our, our shirts. We just show our badge on a chain and we tuck it back in. So our approach very uh, early on in the intervention is very non-threatening mm-hmm. uh, because in, in policing and law enforcement, your first level of use of force is just your mere appearance, right? right? So um, and what we try to do, what Joe and I always tried to do was never focus on the problem, right? The problem is usually emotionally charged. We always tried to focus on the person and used a trauma-informed care approach, person-centered focus, right? So there's a lot of things that can cause a problem and can cause you to be emotionally charged. But let's let's peel it back a little bit. Let's look at this and try to make a connection, Because that was the true essence of what this documentary is about. It's not about following two San Antonio police officers on a ride along. Mm -hmm. It's about what type of human connection are they having to people in crisis? And then what do these outcomes look like? So for this gentleman, it was one of the um, it was actually an easier encounter because by the time we got there, uh, he was outside smoking. Right. A lot of officers are going to walk up and say, hey, put your cigarette out while I'm talking to you. I, that's not the case with us. It's like, hey, if that right. calms you down, have another one for all I care. Um, and just to de-escalate and then try to be empathetic as to what the issue is and make that human connection. Uh, try our best to say, hey, you know what? If that would have happened to me, I might have reacted the same way. What we can't do, though, is validate negative behaviors. Right? Mm-hmm. We can't condone assaulting others because you're upset about something. Right? right. We've got to try to navigate this carefully but do so in a way that's professional and represents your organization or agency at the highest level. Nice. And and what sort of pushback did you get? I heard heard the phrase hugs for thugs in the show. What pushback did you get from the force? Well, originally, um, the course that we were teaching, it's a 40-hour crisis intervention training, and we were offering it to officers on a voluntary basis. So those who wanted to come. Mm -hmm. Uh, The chief at the time, William McManus, saw value in the training and said, well, you know what? I want all my officers to go through this. And that's where the pushback came, because there were officers that had 30 years on the department that said, I would rather retire than take this kind of class. Like, I'm not going to go out there and become a social worker. And like, I'm not asking you to, but you've been doing it your whole career, whether you think so or not. You just have to change perspective. Right. And understand that. You, if you're ignorant about something like I was, I'm going to be honest with you, Chris, if you'd have called me to your home for a mental health crisis prior to 2003, I would have done you a disservice, mm-hmm. really would have. And I say that not because I'm ashamed at 
at saying it, but I'm proud of where I'm at now Mm -hmm. because I understand and I have more insight into what mental health and mental illness is. I had no clue. I was only educated from what the media was showing me on television. I was like, oh, my goodness, this is scary. Um, I'm scared. Uh, I don't want to interact with people that have mental illness in a crisis because I don't know what to do. Uh, All I know how to do is arrest somebody and put them in jail, which is definitely the wrong approach and is why our jails and prisons are the largest population when it comes to those being um, detained for for mental illness. So this was uh, a pushback from the department in a way until they got finished with the class. And after a week long of training, now they understood. And what I what we found very quickly were the officers that pushed back the most was because they had they had been impacted directly at some point in their life by some type of mental health issue, whether it was a family member or themselves, where they had tried to take somebody for help and then the door was shut on them and they're like, forget it. Uh, I'll never do this. Or they I took them in and they turned around and released them really quick. So I don't believe in this system. It's broken, right? I don't think it's ever worked to begin in the first place uh, after deinstitutionalization in the 70s, but um, we've got to find a way to better train these officers. And this was an opportunity. And once the entire department was trained mm-hmm. in crisis intervention, we noticed some things happen very quickly. One, the number of people that were being involuntarily committed to hospitals now was going up, which was a good thing because they weren't going to jail. Yeah. And yeah. that the number of uses of forces on the department was coming down because officers understood the concept of de-escalation. So um, you said you're you're part of a task force. What was this? Um, was this started in San Antonio or, or where did this begin? Yeah, the training actually started out in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, back in the in the 80s. Uh, it was when in, some officers had a contact with an individual that was in a mental health crisis that was holding the knife. And he walked towards the officers. The officers opened fire and killed him. A um, couple of issues with that uh, incident was one, it was two white officers and the gentleman was African-American. So there was uh, some outcry within the community. Mm -hmm. But what they also realized was that the officers didn't know what else to do. And they were struggling as well because they said, we didn't know what else to do. Like, what are we supposed to do when somebody approaches us with a knife? We didn't we didn't know that he had bipolar disorder. We thought maybe he was high on drugs or so with that incident, Memphis, Tennessee partnered uh, with the local university and the National Alliance on Mental Illness and created this 40-hour concept of crisis intervention training. So a lot of departments offer crisis intervention training, but that one's known as the Memphis model. And it's a 40-hour week-long course with role plays and subject matter experts coming in, where a lot of departments maybe will just check a box and do a 16-hour course and and call it that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because in CIT, it's very decentralized. So it doesn't look the same in California like it looks in Colorado, like it looks in Texas. Uh, which is a problem uh, because it really should be, there's some things in law enforcement that really should be standardized, right? Like the definition of use of force, right? This is intervention training. There are some things and just nothing is the same no matter where you go. So um, that, that definitely plays a key into how officers respond and, and uh, try to interact with somebody in a crisis. So if um, going back to that first individual that, you know, was, uh, you interacted with on the documentary um had that person been wielding a knife how would it have been different well of course distance is your friend and anytime you're uh dealing with anybody that's emotionally charged so it would Mm -hmm. have to be you'd have to start with distance and at least position yourself in in a in a position of some type of cover Um, you know for us probably would have been we would have stepped back behind the vehicle and just said hey look you're not in trouble we just came here to help, but it's, we cannot talk to you as long as you're holding that knife. If you, if you will put the knife down and step away from it, we'll meet you halfway and we'll talk. You're not going to go in handcuffs. We're just going to make sure that you don't have any more weapons and let's find out what's causing this issue, right? Um, just a different approach rather than just pull out your your gun and start yelling and screaming, right. put the knife down, put the effing knife down, right? And then Joe's turn and he'll yell it until he gets tired and, and then these things just lead to bad outcomes. So... Mm-hmm. You have to understand what you're dealing with when you're dealing with somebody in a mental health crisis. You have to be emotionally intelligent yourself and be able to check your own emotions uh, so you can deal with somebody and do it appropriately. Have you had an 
a situation where where you're dealing with somebody and suddenly there became a threat to your life? And how did you react with that? Um, there were several that we were talking to. Uh, one individual early on, uh, right after the training, we got a call from an individual that was threatening to kill his wife and then himself. And I got to the apartment, opened the door. The wife came out and she said he had a rifle, hmm. uh, but he had just taken a whole lot of uh, Tylenol. Um, so I knew that time was going to go against us if we didn't try to, to deal with this. So as I'm opening the door, I can see straight into the apartment and he is sitting on the floor. He's got the, the rifle between his legs and pointed in his mouth. So the direct threat was on him and not us, although we did have deadly force available in case the rifle would have come our way. And he was very upset. He found some emails about his wife uh, thinking she was having an affair. Um, but he, I could see he was getting tired. He was starting to, to slump over. And I told him, I said, look, you know, we've got some medics outside. You're not in trouble. I would need to ask you a serious question, though. Do you really want to die or do you want the pain that you're in to stop? If you can answer that question for me, then I think we've, we can figure this out. And he said, I just want this pain to go away. I said, then put the rifle down. Let's get these medics in here and get you taken care of. And I'm going to be with you at the hospital. And he put the rifle down and we were able to load him up and go. Um, so there have been situations like that where we've had a deadly force possible outcome. Mm -hmm. But then we've also uh, had people that have completed a suicide in front of us. You know, mm -hmm. I, I can remember a person Joe and I was talking to on a bridge who had already, he had just committed a murder and shot a second person. And then in exchange of all that, he got shot in the leg, uh, drove to an overpass and stopped his truck. And people started calling in saying, hey, there's some guy on this bridge that wants to jump. And as we were getting all the intelligence of everything that was going on, we realized, well, this is the guy that's involved in this murder and ag assault. And he shot as well. So we, we stayed up on that bridge talking to him probably three hours. It was in the low 40s. It was extremely cold. He was bleeding pretty good. We had an EMS unit parked down at the bottom of the bridge. And the decision was made by a supervisor that we were going to try to approach and pull him over. We had already found the weapon that was in his truck that was parked maybe 50 yards uh, just south of him. Mm -hmm. So as we were putting the harness uh, on one of the negotiators and tying it off around the car uh, to approach him and try to pull him over because one, he'd been sitting up there for hours and thought he's not really going to be able to climb over himself. Right. And two, he's lost quite a bit of blood. Uh, and we need to try to get that turn, put a tourniquet on as quick as we can as soon as we pull him over. Uh, but as soon as the negotiator started to walk towards him, he turned over and looked at Joe uh, and said, well, I guess it's now or never. And then he jumped. Jeez. And about mm -hmm. three seconds later, you hear like a, Pow, like a gunshot going off. And I'm I'm scared of heights. So I did not look over the edge, but Joe ran over and I'm like, oh man, how what does it look like? He's like, man, it's bad. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh God. So sometimes you have these negative outcomes that will happen no matter what you do. And that was based on the totality of the situation, which was a murder and ag assault and him yeah. having no way out. Right. Yeah. And um I guess what what percentage would you say of uh, of the forces around the country have a crisis intervention team? Not many, because these are specialized units. Now, I will say that a, a lot of them have crisis intervention training. I wouldn't say it's the Memphis model because people have to take in consideration that the average size police department in the United States is about 12 officers. Yeah. So to give up an officer to go to a week long class means overtime. And it's just it's a very difficult ask for small agencies. So and then to have a specialized unit, you really need to have a larger uh, agency to be able to create these specialized units. Uh, I just got back from Denver yesterday and they've got several different programs out there. They have a co-responder unit where they put an officer with a clinician. Uh, they've got a unit where they put a medic with a clinician that responds to lower level mental health crisis calls where there's not a um, high propensity for violence or danger. Mm -hmm. And then they have a collaborative community outreach where it's just two clinicians that go out and walk the streets every day and helping people with ID recovery, uh, find shelter and clothing and food stamps. So they've really got a pretty robust system out there the way they're doing it, where 
Um, even in San Antonio, we pair a medic with a clinician and an officer and send them out on the street, um, which is an expensive ask, right? Mm -hmm. Because now you're talking a full-fledged paramedic who carries sedation drugs. So it's a higher level of training, an officer, high level of training, and then a master licensed social worker, uh, six years of schooling and college and licensing. Um, so some of these, some of these programs can be very expensive where Denver um, they have different levels of response based on the need of the individual, which is a smart way of doing it, but it's very manpower intensive as well. Mm -hmm. Nice. And um, how about the effects you've seen uh, from these kind of trainings and putting these programs in, in use uh, as, as far as the numbers? Because that's what it boils down to, right? Yeah, well, I can tell you this. It's a huge cost savings uh, to taxpayers. Mm -hmm. We just did an audit here in San Antonio on one of the programs where we identified the top 100 highest utilizers of the acute health care system when it came to mental health, which meant these were the individuals that were police were encountering on the streets that were having to be involuntarily committed. So we gathered the information from the fire department, police department, local mental health authority, and the hospital systems for continuity of care of these patients to find out who they were. Mm -hmm. uh, so we used um, the criteria of six or more involuntary commitments a year. So once we identified the top 100, uh, the hospital systems put money to establish one of these units, which was two San Antonio police mental health officers, two paramedics from mobile integrated health with the fire department, and five care clinicians with a psychiatrist and nurse from our local mental health authority. And we went out and pre-engaged these people before they called 911 to find out where the gap in service was. Why do you keep ending up in the hospital? Or why do you keep ending up in the back of a police car? And once we were able to identify where the issue was, and it could have been, well, I don't have access to a psychiatrist. Okay, well, we have one. Uh, I don't have access uh, to medication. Okay, we have a budget for that. I don't have transportation to get to my appointment. We got you covered. Uh, I mean, you name it. Because the money wasn't grant funded and earmarked for anything in particular, we were able to be very flexible with how we use the money to offer assistance to these people. And what we found was after an independent audit by a third party uh, company that the 100 people that we started with and that list would change as they would get better, we would transition them to a low level of care and bring on somebody else. In, in a two-year period, it saved the city over $4 million of police response and hospital bills of dealing with just these highest frequent, uh, they call them familiar faces, I guess, right, right, that we're right. running into time and time again. So a lot, of the, a lot of times, Chris, if these programs don't make dollars, they don't make sense, right? So there was a cost savings, and that's good for uh, those that run these agencies and organizations, but for me... As a person who doesn't care if you have insurance or not, mm -hmm. your quality of life that I have seen improve makes a world of difference to me. Watching people get um, disability benefits for the first time because somebody helped them with documentation. Yeah. And I can remember one gentleman in particular. I, I encountered him in the criminal justice system. He was uh, awaiting a pending trial for a charge he had. Uh, the charge he had landed him there in jail that day because he was in a mental health crisis. So I approached the judge and the prosecutor and said, if I can get him to voluntarily come into our program and I work with him and get him in case management on medications and do whatever you want to do for pretrial services, community service, if we can do all the things you're asking him to do mm -hmm. and he doesn't get in trouble and he makes all his appointments, will you dismiss this charge? And they said, yes. And they let me work with him for six months. Incredible. Um, results, right? Because when people are on their medications and in case management, if that's what they need, then they're not going to be, there's not going to be recidivism and they're not going to end up back in the criminal justice system or in the acute healthcare system. And I can remember when he got his benefits, I got a phone call. I was walking with my wife, man, if I get emotional here, I'm sorry. That's okay. But he called and he said, Ernie, man, you're not going to guess, guess what? I'm like, Hey, what's going on? And he's like, I just got my disability check, man. I'm going to take my mom to Olive Garden. <laughs> and that was so, like, so important to him. And I, I take these things for granted sometimes. Like, mm. I'll drive up and be like, oh, Olive Garden, man, the line's too long. Let's go somewhere else. Where, <laughs> like, this was 
everything to him that he could do this for his mom who had supported him all these years. And it's that's what I measure success. It's not how much money did we save the taxpayers. I know people need to know that. I don't give a I really don't <laughs> care, man. I'm watching this guy uh, who's using this money to buy groceries now and, and get his medications and paint the house and do things um, that he never had the opportunity before. Amen. Amen. Uh, and, and talk about that, the the follow through that uh, is that part of the system or is that just take somebody who's got a heart? to? Yeah. So during the filming of the documentary, that was just something Joe and I did on our own. We we could not follow up on every single call we went on. Uh, we were just too busy. But we knew those that probably needed a little extra help trying to navigate uh, the convoluted system of mental health. It gets very uh, disheartening and confusing. So we knew that we would have to follow up with some or else we were going to be making a call right back on them again. So back then we kind of had to handpick nowadays uh, with San Antonio, they have follow-up clinicians. So the clinicians that actually go out with the officer on the 911 call will do a follow-up into a database. The next day, the follow-up clinician gets an alert that, Hey, the, the, um, co-responder team went out on this crisis yesterday. Can you follow up with this patient who needs substance use treatment and maybe linkage to an intake appointment? Mm -hmm. So now the follow-up clinician the very next day meets the patient, either if they're at the hospital or at a home or apartment. Hopefully they're not unhoused. They're a little bit more difficult to find that way. But if they can find them the next day, they can immediately start that that follow-up service. And more importantly, they have assigned and hired a peer specialist to these programs. So these are people who are in recovery themselves. And like, I know where to take somebody for help when I need to, but I don't know what help looks like. And I don't know what the back door looks like of these facilities. A peer specialist does. A peer specialist knows what group therapy looks like and individual therapy looks like. And they understand what uh, the re-entry program looks like if they're coming out of jail or leaving a facility and what next steps are. So these people are worth their weight in gold, and they're not utilized nearly enough in a lot of these new um, programs that are established. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier, I think you just got back from Denver. Um, And what is your role as it relates to that, traveling around and talking to other departments? Yeah. So I'm I'm the newly appointed uh, deputy division director for the Council of State Government. So we work, we're a nonprofit agency, but we work hand in hand with the Bureau of Justice Assistance which falls under the the umbrella of the DOJ. And they offer a lot of grant opportunities uh, for the Justice Mental Health Collaboration Programs for agencies and departments that want to start these type of programs that we've been talking about. So as they turn into grantees, Mm -hmm. um, our job at CSG and mine being in charge of law enforcement is to make sure that they are going through the process of the planning stage correctly and then the implementation of these programs. Number one, are they using the money for what they're supposed to be using it for? And two, um, are they running into any issues along the way where we can do some technical assistance to help them try to navigate, right? Because I've seen it all. Mm -hmm. If leadership is not bought in from the top down, you're going to have difficulties. If these agencies continue to stay siloed and not work with local mental health authorities and hospital systems, you're going to have problems. So it's breaking the barriers collaborating, listening to what the community has asked for. And that's an alternative response Mm -hmm. to mental health crisis calls. Stop sending just a police car and an officer that doesn't know how to properly deal with this. Give us an alternative response with less negative outcomes Mm -hmm. and let's collaboratively work together. And that's what my job is now as I travel the U.S. and, and check in on these programs. And hopefully this is going to continue to increase in grant funding by the BJA and technical assistance by the Council of State Governments. Excellent. And and how can, if somebody in uh, city government or police department uh, is, hears this and is wondering how can they get involved, how, how do they reach you? Well, you can reach me. Um, easiest way really is get on my LinkedIn page and let me find out what your need is. So it's, I'm just Ernest Stevens on LinkedIn. Um, that's usually the easiest way to, to get a hold of me so I can mm-hmm. figure out what your need is and where you're at. Um, I would encourage if you're an agency, an officer, or leadership uh, to visit the Bureau of Justice Administration website and look at what opportunities 
are available. And it's not just co-responder units. It's what can we do on the front end initiatives to divert people from going to jail um, with these jail diversion programs? Or how about the re-entry programs when they're getting out of jail or prison? What can we do to make sure that they don't? In- so there's a lot of different uh, grant funding opportunities through the BJA. And then us at the council state governments, we offer that technical assistance with uh, toolkits, planning and implementation guides. You're welcome to visit the website there, Council of State Governments Justice Center. And again, just reach out if you're interested in any of these types of programs or funding opportunities, and we'll get you pointed in the right direction. Excellent. And if um, just average Joe citizen is hearing this and like me thinking, oh, this is you know something my city needs, what action can we take? I would contact your local government and find out, does your police department, are they CIT trained? Um, at what level? Is it just a check the box or is there some continuing education involved in this? Because every state is different. Um, find out, uh, you know, what what opportunities are available for this agency. Like contact your chief of police and say, hey, what are you doing for mental health response in the community? Are you still sending just an officer or are you collaborating with your local mental health authority? How can I be involved? Can I assist with training? We, Our training wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for volunteers. They came in and, and we would assign them role play scenarios. So, nice. I mean, it takes a village to be successful. And it also takes healthy officers. Yeah. Officers are involved in some very traumatic events throughout their career. Mm-hmm. So departments need to invest into their officers because healthy officers make healthy communities. And that's something I think gets overlooked as well from time to time. Amen. Er, Ernie Stevens, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me and sharing some of this this fascinating and great work that y'all are doing. Well, Chris, thank you again. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Anytime we have a platform to talk about the intersections of mental health and law enforcement, always count me in, my friend. Cool. Hey, I want to thank Ernest Stevens for sitting down with me and sharing some of his fascinating story and uh, some of the amazing work that he is doing. 